is the Vintage RPG Podcast. Your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs. With your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse, hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and today we have an interview with a true icon of fantasy art, Russ Nicholson. Some of you might know him from his work on the Fabled Land series, as well as Fighting Fantasy, and if you've ever heard me reference the Grell on this show, you know that I'm talking about the one that Russ Nicholson drew in the Fiend Folio. Due to some technical difficulties, being that he is overseas in the UK, and we do have to record some of these interviews over the internet, we pieced this episode together from several different interviews that took place over the course of a couple months. Now that being said, Russ will also tell you in this interview that his memory isn't the best, so there's a question or two he just doesn't answer. And that said, Russ tells some amazing stories spanning not just his career, but his life as well. So I can't impart to you enough, dear listener, that some of the things you're going to hear today are truly special. So without further ado, the fabled Russ Nicholson. All right, so we have a very special guest today, don't we, Stu? We do. Russ Nicholson, legendary fantasy artist, is joining us on the podcast today. Russ, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, excuse me, you can't be eating something. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Last thing I want to do is choke. <laughs> <laughs> that would be terrible. We need to keep you healthy and alive. So, Russ, let's start right at the beginning. Tell us how you got into art. Well, I've always liked art, literally since a small boy. And this is pre... <laughs> this is going right back, actually, because this is really pre-internet. I mean, there's so much stuff on the internet now. I actually follow a lot of bits and bobs, you know, art stuff, because I've never seen it before. Well, you may take from my accent that I'm Scottish. I was going to ask, you do sound Scottish. You're in England now, right? I am. Yes, I've actually, I've lived in England probably longer than I lived in Scotland. So that's my accent. <laughs> well, you know what? As Mike Myers said in So I Married an Axe Murderer, if it's not Scottish, it's crap. <laughs> it's true. Well, the last time I was in Scotland, they didn't believe I was Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> How rude. So there you go. I always wanted to be something to do with art. Right, um, and primarily illustration, funnily enough, rather than being a painter. And if you will believe this, originally I wanted to draw for a British children's comic called The Beano. Back in the 60s, you could leave school at the age of 15. And in fact, that was the first year that I got a tax invoice, even though I was still at school. Now the government's always going to get their money, so. <laughs> oh, God, yes. <laughs> Trust me on this one. And so, with the help of my mother, we wrote to D.C. Thompson to ask where they're hiring and we'd look at some artwork and all the rest of it. And we got a very nice letter back, which basically said no. <laughs> but we like trained artists who've gone to art college. And if once you've got art college training, come back and talk to us. So I looked at the situation, realised that um, I would have to go and get what they call in Scotland hires, the same as English A-levels. Did all that, got to college, did four years, and the degree level. In fact, originally, I actually didn't want to do the degree at all. I wanted to do the illustration course that was there at Dundee, fancy name Duncan of Jordanson College of Art, which is now the Dundee University. And I contacted D.C. Thompson again, because that's in the same city, and said, so would you like to look at some of my work, and et cetera, et cetera. And they said, oh, no, we only train our own. We don't like people who've been to art college. Oh, jeez. It was a pure <laughs> catch-22. So I was offered an extra year at college and what they call postgraduate. And so I took that and then realized I would have to try and find a job. And I knew that very few and far between were jobs in Scotland, unless you knew somebody. So I went south. My mother had already moved south. And from there, I went into London, tried to find an artist agent, because in those days, publishers would look at you unless you had an artist agent. Found one, but realized that with the few jobs I was getting, I would have to get a proper job. So I started work at an advertising agency, basically the equivalent of a, a sweatshop. It did everything. And I'll be truthful, in four weeks, Working there, I learned more than four years at art college. <laughs> Isn't that the way? Yeah. In fact, somebody asked me recently, what would I advise? You know, and the one thing is, don't go to art college. 
which is <laughs> ironic because you taught art college for a long time, right? I did indeed. Amusingly, I later did become a comic artist in some of the DC uh, comics, but the Giddles comics, and I did that for several years. Like romance comics? Uh, yes, there were titles like Bunty. I'm trying to think now, actually, I've got piles of them because I used to get them just to see what my work looked like. That is one of the things I've always adored. I think that's the difference why, why I wanted to be an illustrator and not there. I love, and I mean I love, seeing my work in print, even to this day. So I keep on working. As long as I've got fans and people like my work, then I keep on working. You know? um, but my memory is a bit dodgy now. I won't bore you, but a few years ago I had a stroke. I had cancer. I'm in remission. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Um, the, the stroke has dissipated, but it has affected my memory. It, it bounces backwards and forwards. So with my illustration degree, I headed to London to first find an agent to help find work. This at first started off all right, but with limited funds and best materials to use proved a stretch. So I had to find a full-time job. I did find illustrative work, um, but it was usually what somebody else wanted me to do. It dried up as taste changed, and the infamous three-day week, we had a three-day week in the 1970s in, in this country, and it caused havoc. Because it, although the actual three-day week only lasted a short while, its effect, especially in the advertising and illustrative uh, world, lasted years. And really, unless you were established with a very big agency, you had little chance of getting any work. The final straw working in, in London was that I was laid off from that commercial house I was talking about. So I scrambled along looking for paying work of any kind. I kept drawing, and as fantasy work was always a driving force, I began to submit work to many small, self-published fanzines that proliferated in the 70s. British ones, American ones, and Canadian ones. This led in turn to being contacted by White Dwarf magazine, where I did some work. So what was that like working at White Dwarf during that time period? Because that is the genesis of when tabletop RPGs were occurring all across the world. Technically, it was owned by Steve Jackson and Ian Livingston, I believe. I'm very vague on this. Another person whom I know well and is a friend, actually, Jamie Thompson, worked there at the same time. He is partially responsible with Dave Morris for the, the Fabled Land series. Okay. And I've done all the interior illustrations for those up to book eight. Oh, wow. Originally, when I was doing small drawings for White Dwarf, they, they sort of contacted me. I'd been doing stuff for a British fantasy group called the British Fantasy Society, who um, I would send in work, and then they asked me for work, and could you help with this, and could you do that, and all the rest of it. And I was quite delighted to do so. And then they actually started paying me. <laughs> How delightful. <laughs> yes, that was, that was a novelty. <laughs> In the interim, of course, as I said, I actually, with all this three-day week and being laid off from first one, then two, then three different agencies, I did find work up in Norfolk, but the problem was very simple. The amount they were going to pay me was, once I'd paid for living expenses and or bus fare, I had no money left. <laughs> so I thought to myself, I've got to do something completely different. And some people had said to me in the past that I was good at explaining things. Personally, I thought that school was shite. <laughs> I absolutely loathed it, especially when I was in Glasgow. You're in good company here. Oh, I won't talk about it, but I really hated it. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to become a teacher of art. And one of the things you had to do for postgraduate was to talk about your early education. And I, I just let it out. <laughs> and everything. And the primary thing was to try and never be the kind of people I'd met when I was at school. This is back in uh, 1979. Uh -huh. And I got a job, and that was fine and all the rest of it. And stuff started to come in from Games Workshop. And then they started to ask me about some work for a particular thing which they were going to connect with TSR called the Fiend Folio. Some of the pictures I had already done for White Dwarf, others they asked me to do some fresh ones. And they asked me to do some other bits and pieces. And I happily did those. And they paid me a pittance, but I was perfectly happy. Um, and I said, but I can have my artwork back. And they said, oh, yes, of course you can have your artwork back. So then they asked me, oh, have you got any other work? Because we need some fillers. So, for example, the first two drawings in Fiend Folio, one of which has got my name taken off it, I lent them. I didn't give them to the TSR. I lent that artwork with a proviso and promise 
In those days, it was a letter, mostly, that we corresponded to return the work. Did they? No. No, they didn't. I've never seen it since. Rotten. Which piece of art was that? Well, if you look at the very first page of the Queen Folio, the very first one, which is the creature with a little tail, a demon, and he's sort of turning around and he's, he's showing you. I drew that a long time before the Queen Folio. I did it for myself. There's one where there's a skeletal guy sitting and he's talking to his killer or whoever. That was one. The Grell and, of course, the Githyanki were commissioned but they never returned them. Those sons of bitches. And then Steve Jackson contacted me and asked me if I would like to do some little drawings and stuff, actually, for games. Basically, one of them was a Doctor Who one. This is, It came out in 1980. Oh, my God. That has to be amazing. And most of that stuff wasn't returned either. No. Oh. wasn't too worried about that. He paid reasonably well. And the other one was a game called The Wizard, which I did playing cards for. And I think the plane cars one came first, and then the next one was the, the Doctor Who, that was Counters. But both of them sank without trace, I think. And they're not even listed properly in the Games Workshop canon of what games they do. And then I'd realised I'd done five years at, at school, and the only thing I was really enjoying teaching at school wasn't the art, because that, was, that, that just had become rote. After five years, you become, it's, it's like a cycle thing. You know, you've done everything, and then you've got to make a decision. Move on. Or realize that's it, pal. <laughs> and I thought, no, I've got to do something else. So I applied for a couple of jobs um, in one of the educational newspapers and uh, got an interview to go to work in Papua New Guinea. Wow, that's, uh, that's a bit of a commute. Yeah, it was a wee bit. And uh, I got that, worked there for three years. And I, I wish I actually had stayed longer. So Russ, at this point, you've done games work for Games Workshop and TSR, you've done comic work, you've taught art, but is there any particular artist who's influenced or inspired your style? That's one of those really tough questions. When I was a boy, I ate anything that was art. It didn't matter whether it was a picture in a book, if it was good, if it was in a comic, if it was good, if I saw it in a museum, if it was good, if it was in a newspaper, a magazine, etc. I am an art nut. Right, I love all art, right from cave painting all the way right through to anything modern. So, Russ, you're best known for your black and white work. Is that your preferred medium? In a way, yes, but I'm perfectly happy working in color. It's just I have, I've had few opportunities, really. So what do you think is your favorite project that you had the opportunity to work on in color? It's not actually been published yet. Oh, really? Yeah, I've been working on it for 10 years. Uh, last year it was supposed to be coming out and we did the last couple of pictures for it, but something's bogged him down, the, the chap who's doing it. Um, he lives in Seattle and it hasn't come out, so I don't know if I can really talk about it. Well, we'll leave a little air of mystery then. <laughs> right. Can you give us a little hint? Is it a game? Yes, it's a game. Quite a complex game, in fact. I did all the black and white work for it. I did all the color work for it. There are four different separate units and I did the cover for each. Well, we'll certainly be on the lookout for that. Yeah, for sure. As far as your drawings go, I am in love with the way that you draw monsters. I definitely had a few Russ Nicholson-inspired nightmares as a kid. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Can you talk a bit about what inspires you to draw these monsters? The very first book that I came across that had monsters in it was a book that belonged to my grandmother. It was the, the Lang's um, Red Fairy book. I was four, and I, although I couldn't read it properly, I could see the pictures by an artist called, I forget his initials, but Ford, and I liked those. And there was one in particular, which in its own way used to give me nightmares, which was this particular giant keeps dead children under his open floorboards. That's scary. He puts his hand in to um, have a tasty bit. And one of them, of course, is the lad, I can't remember the character's name, and who's alive, and because he's hiding in there. That stuck in my head, still does, really. I scare very easily. We used to live in a haunted house. Really? Oh, yeah. We all had everything. <laughs> Flying doors open, bumps in the night, heavy breathing over your shoulder. <laughs> a lot. Now, did you ever look into what made the house haunted, say, when you got a little older? Well, it was in a small village, and it originally had been three weavers' cottages. They'd all been joined together. And each part had a different bit. There was one bit where, for example, our dog, um, she was a doorman, 
who was a very brave dog, there was a spot every now and again she would not cross it. And every now and again, she, her hackles would rise. And I remember once when I was on my own, this was years later, whilst I was at the art college because I used to spend my summers back in the old house. I was sleeping in a, basically in a camp bed. I hadn't gone to my own bed. Um, and the dog used to like sleeping at the bottom of the bed. And she sat up in the dark and she just started to growl. And <laughs> to be honest, the hairs in the back of my neck stood up like nobody's business. Holy crap. The hairs in the back of my neck are standing up right now. Oh, man, that's wild. Yeah. My mother used to say, actually, was that sometimes she had little lights dancing across. We used to sleep in bunks, my brother and I. And she said occasionally she would see little fairy light things dancing around the, the beds. Like that's the nature of such things. That's amazing. I mean, I could go on about that sort of thing, but it was primarily that one house. And do you think that had a direct correlation to the work that you did, to the inspiration of the work? Good question. Not so sure. Possibly it certainly directed me in that direction. I mean, I've always been interested in the world of what you might call, not fantasy, but fairy, you know, with a capital F. Right. And when I was in my teens, I did do a couple of stupid things, like trying to see if I could make contact with anybody. Wow. And it was that sort of knock three times. And guess what? I got three knocks back. Oh, no. That's scary. Yes. He had the living daylights out of me. And I asked them very quickly, go back, go back. I don't want to know. Round about, I lived in Scotland, in Persia, and there was a whole period where Ouija boards were very popular. And we used to sort of do that sort of thing. And of course, it was always that thing of, you know, who's doing anything sort of business. We got a couple of things come through. Most of it actually was gibberish. But every now and again, you would get something. And my mother decided, no, we're not doing this anymore. We were in our teens. And my brother, who was a total, total skeptic, took some friends and they had a Ouija meeting sort of business. And there were about, I think, two boys and about eight girls all around the table. And the table took off. And he told us about this. And I said, and you did it? And he says, no. And I said, well, so what happened? He says, I don't know. But the, the girls ran out of the room screaming and that was it. <laughs> yeah, that should be it. Don't mess with demons. Jeez, or anything spooky. Jeez. I don't know what they are. The reason I mentioned Persia is because of a few days later in the papers, there was a whole spate of letters all about Ouija boards and being contacted by this particular entity. It said it was neither good nor evil, neither living nor dead. It termed itself a carrier. It was a sort of sensation in the papers for a couple of weeks. And, well, that's Scots for you. But then again, you see, actually, they go back to the days of Rabbi Burns and Tam and all the rest of it. So this is all really formative, sort of spooky stuff. And I think that this is a good way to segue into my next question. You have a dark sensibility in your art that I think comes through. It's like a real gritty, often very violent, kind of aesthetic like even with just actual blood you don't really see actual blood in american fantasy art of the period so was that an intentional choice on your part or is it just something that kind of came out in the art if it was relevant i thought to the story i did it if i was going to do gore and blood and spatter i enjoyed it <laughs> you know and when I did Warlock of Fartop Mountain one of these of course was the ghoul and the original description that I was given, was actually quite horrible. It's not as it was written in the book, because all I got was the description. I thought, well, this is supposed to be aimed at 12-year-olds. That's what I was told, you know, by Puffin. I actually toned it down. And a few days later, when the book came out, they actually gave me the cutting from the Daily Telegraph, which is a British newspaper. And it said, one of the most disgusting pictures ever presented to a child in a children's book is this, and it was the ghoul. Oh, that's amazing. I just loved it. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. It's one of my favorite quotes. Sadly, um, I used to carry it about in my wallet and somebody nicked it. Well, through some of this art, you did design one of my favorite, and I can speak for Stu, one of Stu's favorite D&D &D monsters of all time, the Grell. Where did the look of the Grell come from? It was the same as the Gusienki. It originally appeared in the, the magazine White Dwarf, which was part of Elder Games Workshop. That was their house organ. And uh, they had written up a few lines, you know, this is a so-and-so and it does such and such. The Grell was effectively described as this tentacle thing. And that's what I worked from. From that, I came in with it. The more time I have to think about something, to me, the better the picture is. 
The more rushed I am, the worse I get. I'm not going to claim that all my artwork is good. It's not. But every now and again, I do something that I like. So speaking of the Grell, around this time, were you aware in the early 80s that TSR designed a toy based on your design? No until Stu sent me one. Jeez, Hambo, you're trampling all over my moment of glory here. I didn't know. I, I, apparently not. So anyway, Russ, what was it like when you got that toy into your hands? As I said, I scare very easily, right? I sit and watch something, actually, and my wife sits beside me and she just laughs her head off because she's scared I am. And I'm not scared, scared. It's, how can I put it? It's not what you see, it's what you think you see. I feel the same way about horror movies. Yeah, that's why I don't watch an awful lot of them. I've read horror and so on. I, I liked early Stephen King. I thought they were very well written. His first writings were, to me, very visual. And therefore, I could easily sort of sum up what that was like. There's a film called Francis and the Haunted House. It's Francis the Mule. I think it was the last in the series of seven, and it was the only one that starred Mickey Rooney. And we were living in Glasgow at that time. And my father, he liked Mickey Rooney, and he decided to take me to the cinema. And there was a scene in it where there's a murderer in the back of the car, and it just sort of comes out. And apparently, I don't remember what happened. All I know was I had a screaming attack. My father had to take me out of the cinema. Everybody was as noisy as hell. And years later, I watched the scene, and what I saw never happened. I imagine something completely different. And every now and again, I do things like that. There was a series, again, this is when we're living in Glasgow, called Quatermass in the Pit. I love that movie. Not the film version, the original TV serial. I love the TV serial, too. My brother used to watch it from behind a chair. I really enjoyed it, up until the point where there's a character called Sladden. And every time I see the actor, I still think Sladden. And things start to move about in the, the Martian spaceship where the spanner starts to move and all the rest of it, and he runs out and everything starts to go and the music builds and all the rest of it. There's a particular scene where he gets to the church, and apparently at that moment in Glasgow, more or less all the households who were watching it switched the televisions off, and there was a power surge, because there was suddenly too much power, but no, 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 nothing been used. And the next day, it was, a, it was a talk of the school. And what I remember, I was, what, 10? What I remember never happened because I watched it later. It was, only, it was repeated again at Christmas. And my mother said to me, because she hadn't been there when we were watching this, she said, do you want to see it and see what scared you? And I went, no. I said, I'm not going to let something like that scare me. And I went in and what they showed, right, was fine, but it wasn't what I saw. Again, same thing. My imagination took me in a completely different direction. And that's what I have. I have a very vivid imagination. So you've worked with a lot of different companies. I mean, you've worked with TSR, you've worked with Wizards of the Coast. What about working on fighting fantasy? How was that different than, say, some of the other artistic processes you've been involved in? Originally, Steve Jackson contacted me, and they asked me to work on a couple of games. One was a thing called The Wizard or the Warlock or something, and the other was actually to design playing cards. If you look back on my blog, you'll actually see them somewhere. And I had to design these from scratch. The wizard that's in there on those cards is not the one that I eventually use for the warlock. He's completely original. And he actually came as I was working on the final illustrations because I wanted something different. I wanted something that nobody had ever seen before, including me. And from that, they contacted me and asked me to work on this new book that we were going to do called The Warlock of Firetop Mountain. In its original state, it went through four editors. And I remember that because I dealt with each one of them. But all I got really was a quick brief and then this is your deadline, this is how much we're going to pay you, etc. And, and that was it. And I handed the work in. They loved it. I was offered the second book and I said, yes, absolutely. And I asked for more money. They granted it. I was then offered the third book. Um, and then I saw an advert um, for a job in Papua New Guinea. And I applied for it. I got it. And I went there. And I worked there for three years. Now, during all of that period, I worked on one fantasy book. That was for a chap called Dave Morris, who was a friend. And that eventually became the Fabled Land series. Did you ever end up doing the third fighting fantasy book? No. In fact, that's why there's a gap. The amusing joke is that the chap whom I've now met, a very nice guy, who did the third book, he got paid more than I asked for. 
In fact, everybody got paid more than I had for <laughs> <laughs> until I came back in basically 86 and said, um, is there any chance of any work? And they said, oh, yes, absolutely. And they started sending me scripts again. I'll be honest, actually, the one disappointment I had was I was promised the return to Warlock Mountain, which was supposed to be the 50th book in the series. And I was looking forward to doing that. And at the last minute, I don't know why, don't know the decision, I wasn't told, they used somebody completely different. Ah, that's a shame. And that was a a disappointment because I was really looking forward to doing the 50th return to the Warlock of Firetop Mountain. Ah, geez, that is such a missed opportunity. Despite that being a disappointment, you've had a fantastic career. And I'm wondering if out of all of the books that you've done, you have a particular favorite. Fable Land. Oh, hands down, huh? That's great. Yeah. I mean, basically, I worked very closely with Dave Morris and to a certain extent, Jamie Thompson on that series. And we interacted very well. And I enjoyed working with them both. They're totally different characters. But Dave and I, I was usually, he would give me a sort of rough idea of what he was after. I would pencil a sketch. He would say, that's it. And then we'd draw it up. Hey, Russ, thank you so much for joining us on this interview. I hope some of it made sense. It's been a real pleasure, Russ. Thanks for coming on. Thanks again. My pleasure. Right. And goodbye. Thanks again to Russ Nicholson for your time and your patience and for just sharing such amazing stories with Stu, myself, and all of our listeners. You could actually check out his work at russnicholson.blogspot.com. We're going to include a link to that in the show notes as well. Definitely go over there and check out some of his artwork. If you already have that copy of the Fiend Folio that you cherish, why don't you pull it off the bookshelf and thumb through it? You'll immediately remember exactly why you fell in love with his artwork in the first place. So thanks again, Russ, and thank you, dear listener, for tuning in for another awesome episode of the Vintage RPG Podcast. For Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 